Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to discuss your word, to go through your Torah and to glean wisdom and insights that's applicable for us in this day, in this age that we're living within our physical world, within the prophetic cycle, as well as on a spiritual level. Help us to apply these things so we can live according to them and help us to be equipped to become part of your army um, as we progress through this wilderness on our way to the promised land, awaiting your second coming. I ask in all the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Alrighty, so we are in Parasha, was it 34? And it is um, Bamidbar. Now, this is normally translated as the book of Numbers because chapter one and chapter two is about all about numbering people, grouping people, and um, also numbering the priesthood. So, the meaning Bamidbar means in the wilderness or in the desert. So, it's got a slight different meaning. Now, in the Hebrew, on the top left, I've highlighted the two letters, Bet, because Bet means house. And if you think for yourself, traveling through the wilderness, you're exposed to all the elements, everything um, out there, um, wild animals, enemies, cold, wind, water, everything um, out there you will be exposed to. But it, when you're in the fixed structure, you're in the shelter and protection of that fixed structure. And that's why the letter Bet is so important, traveling through the wilderness, because that represents the house of Yahweh, which is a tabernacle. And it also represents the household of Elohim, which are the people, and those are the two Bets that are represented in this word Bamidbar, that is in the desert. Now the desert is a place where something is going to happen. There's a new cycle starting. And um, where we get that, I'm going to get to this a bit later. So we started traveling through the wilderness after we left Egypt on a spiritual level as well as a historic level. And then they entered into a wilderness where they traveled up to the mountain. And after the mountain, they find themselves now again in the wilderness or in the desert. And this time, it is the second month of the second year. So it's a number 2-2. Two, two. We're going to look at the number 2-2 two, two a bit later on, or number 22. And this implies or mean that they've completed a full Moedim cycle at the foot of the mountain or around about the mountain. So they've done all the festivals from Passover right through to Sukkot and they've done their second Passover and that started the second cycle. And this is where the new journey begins or the second journey begins the second cycle within their journey on the way to the promised land. Now what's interesting about the word Bamidbar, if you divide it up between the two main words, which is the Mem Dalet, which is uh, the word mud. That means measure, stature, garment, and armor. And then you get the word Bar, that means field, grain, pure, clean, empty, and sun. So those two things give us an idea of people that will become pure as they empty themselves, they will become clean and they will follow the sun. And the sun we know is the son of Yahweh, which is Yeshua or Mashiach or the commander. He's the commander of armies, which is the word that phrase Yahweh Tzevaot. And he has a measure and he is the one who provide a garment as well as the armor we know paul revealed to us the armor of god and now we see the armor is found within the wilderness context where we find the armor in between the two letter beds because that's where you find the word memdalet or mar and that signify that the 
armor and the garment and the measuring stick and give you the stature or the elevation or the authority can only be found within the tent between the two beds and then you see the bar on the left Resh is leader bar is son that Resh represents the commander the son the Mashiach and he's on the left side so he's the one walking in front leading the armies into the left into the physical through the wilderness and signify symbol symbolic by Moshe, Moses who is leading the people through the wilderness so that's a beautiful picture that we can see from the word Mabitbar, ah, Mabitbar, Bim Mitbar, sorry. And um, this whole desert is a new experience, a new cycle for them. So if they've been taught a lot of basic fundamentals at the mountain and they're now ready to move on to the next level. And we look at the wilderness, the wilderness is not designed for the flesh. The world is designed for the spirit, so the spirit can grow. So that inner strength and that stature and that strength will come from walking through this wilderness with what they learned at the mountain, applied in a practical sense as the army of um, Yahweh. So that's basically the, the whole context of this book. And... Um, Jumping back to the books of the Torah, let's just have a look at that first before we continue. So the book of the Torah consists of five books. First one is Bereshit. Bereshit means in the beginning, which is the starting point, and it has to do with all the creation, everything that's created. Um, everything that came from the mind of the Creator, that He manifests into the physical through speaking into existence, through the word of Yahweh, which is also the living Torah, um, the creative force and means to create things in this world. That also revealed the master plan of the creation and restoration of mankind, where Yahweh changed normal people, fallen people, into Yisrael, or the righteous people of Elohim. So the book of Genesis is all about beginnings. It's all about the starting point. And that is symbolized by the head of the Torah, if you look at the high priest picture there on the right. Now this Torah portion as well is the starting point of a cycle. So we go back to the beginning, thinking back, remembering back, recounting back what we've learned and then applying it. So it's looking back at the beginning. The next book is Exodus or Shemot, that means names or characters. Now this book contains the salvation story, where different characters had a part to play. And the main character of salvation is the Mashiach, the Messiah, the right hand of Yahweh. And he's now extending his right hand through his body, which is the body of Mashiach. So that makes us the right hand collectively, or the mighty right arm of Yahweh. In the physical. So Exodus or Shemot represent all the characters that represent the hands of Yahweh to make things happen in the physical realm to facilitate the story of salvation and the salvation process and the elevation of, of man. Now we had Leviticus. Now as we saw last week, Leviticus of Vayikra is right in the middle of the Torah. Vayikra means and he called. So it's about a calling. And the calling is the heart of the Father. His heart is to call as many people into his house and add, give them access to this uh, salvation so they can um, go back to the origin, the beginning, where he is, where his presence is, where the mind of Yahweh is. Now, Vayikra, or the center of the Torah, is also the heart of the Torah that reveals the heart of the Father. Now, the heart of the Torah is symbolically expressed through the tabernacle which is the house of Yahweh that also houses presence which relates to man's relationship with him and also the sacrificial system as well as the Moedim but mostly the sacrificial system which is the mechanism to deal with sin on a spiritual technical level to restore us back so Yahweh need to do those things in order to strip us from the bondage that there is and the sacrificial system 
has power to play, and that is executed through the work of Messiah, which is expressed through the Moedim. So we learn all about that in Leviticus. Now we are now stepping into Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, which is about the wilderness and the desert. And this is about the history of Israel's journey as they traveled through the wilderness for 40 years on their way to the Promised Land. And this book reveals a lot about um, the enemies that they will encounter, all the challenges that they will encounter, and all the miracles that Yahweh is going to do for them traveling as they travel through the wilderness. So this book of Numbers is basically the walk and it represents the legs and the feet of the Torah. Now the walk we looked at last week is the word halak or halakha. And your walk is every step you take, is every decision you make. And just remember, we're not driving in an air conditioning cooled 4x4 through the wilderness. We are walking through the wilderness step by step. And we walk together in unity with collective body, which is the collective household, the letter bet, and we are following the house of Yahweh, which is his presence, which is the other letter bet, which is representing the representative of the tabernacle or the spiritual side of um, facilitating um, Yahweh's commandments in the physical. Then the last book is Devarim or Deuteronomy. That is repeating the words. It's, it's a plural of words, Devar. And it's basically repeating the Torah. Now, if you repeat the Torah, you can take it two ways. You need to repeat it for you to learn it more. Or you heard it once, and now you're able to repeat it. Now you speak the Torah. So you become the teacher after you were, was the scholar in the beginning. So Devarim is more about stepping up into speaking the words that you learned um, theoretically and walked in it practically. Now you're ready to teach others and to speak the Torah so that the new generation, the new nations can come into the household of Yahweh. So that's just the package of what the Torah is consisting of and why we need the Torah uh, uh, to take us through the whole process and what every book represents. All right, so dangers within the wilderness. The book starts with Numbers 1, verse 1, and Yahweh spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the first day of the second month of the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt. Now, something I haven't said previously, and something that jumped out of me, is Yahweh spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation or in the house. And the house is depicted by the letter bet. Now I've got a picture of a large letter bet there. And I'll place the upside down yod there. The reason I do that is because the word midbar uh, means wilderness as well as mouth as in the organ of speech. Now the organ of speech near the bottom is represented by the letter pay. Pay means mouth. And you're speaking through your mouth. And the little yod that's upside down represents the tongue. And the tongue sits within the house or the bed. And from this letter bed, the anointed tongue is now releasing words or speaking words. And that is what's symbolized by this first verse. This bed is also found in the first word bereshit, which is the last enlarged letter bed. And then all the words flowed from that letter bed. So what this tells me is that Numbers 1 verse 1 is just like Genesis 1 verse 1. Bereshit, in the beginning, the last letter bet, spoke everything that Yahweh wanted to speak. So he said in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth in Bereshit. Now he's speaking and say, lift up their heads, number the people, and order them and structure them. Which is another creation process that's happening in the second cycle. Remember the first cycle was the creation cycle. Then we had the uh, living Egypt cycle. And now we're in a cycle of order and restoration. What uh, connects with that is the word um, midbar is related to the word dabar. That means shepherd, leader, to set in order, to speak, to command, word. That's which is spoken, honeybee and wilderness. 
and we, I've got a picture there of a honeybee and a, and a honeycomb and you can see the structure within the honey, honeycomb and how the bees made that perfectly and everyone work in unison together so there's order and there's structure and it's because of the spoken word and the commandment of Yahweh that is to be spoken by the leader or the shepherd which is that letter Resh or the Bar, the son on the left hand side and what we get as a result of this is the picture at the bottom right is the order of Yahweh because this is the result of the numbering of the people it is to group them into their tribes and to situate them around the tabernacle as they camp and then they also had an order when they traveled so there's always order and when you think about when uh, Israel left Egypt they were basically a mob of people of multiple nations who joined Israel that came out and Yahweh had to give structure to this mob and it took him one year to teach them at the mountain and then with the knowledge they had they could take the next instruction to structure themselves physically and to become a mighty army of Yahweh which is the army of Israel under the leadership of Moses in the same way on the spiritual level if you receive the order of Yahweh's Torah everything we learned at the mountain up to now which is everything to the end of Leviticus we now have the ability to receive the next instruction to order ourselves as a mighty army of Yahweh so you, you might say oh but we are led by the Spirit you can imagine if everyone says that they're led by the Spirit without spending time at the mountain there will be chaos it will just be a mob and everyone will run around thinking they know better than the others and some people might hurt some people might not have heard but you always speak with one voice from the tabernacle of his congregation where the large letter bet is where the Bereshit is the great creation words which is the starting point of Genesis throughout the book of Exodus throughout the book of Leviticus and now we're at the point to take all of that information that flowed from that letter bed take that with the help of the spirit which is this upside down letter yod and then speak order within our physical environment that we're in our physical assembly that we're in situations that we're in in order to structure ourselves as the army of yahweh so this is a beautiful picture um, from this word bamidbar now what's also interesting is Midbar is first used in scripture in Genesis 14 verse 6 which tells the story of the battles between the kings of uh, uh, and, and Abraham when he rescued his nephew Lot because he was taken captive because he was living in the area of Sodom or actually at the, in Sodom so one of the enemies that was mentioned was the Horites which is the word Hor sorry Hori Chet Resh Yod that means cave dweller now Hori or Chor comes from the root word um, Chur that means hole as made by a serpent and it also means prison cell so this is now another form of captivity that is manifesting in the wilderness and this captivity is exactly the same captivity that was in Egypt Pharaoh held the people captive and he used their energy to make bricks to build the prison that will keep them captive so they won't be able to leave. Now in the wilderness there are holes. Now these holes are spiritual holes. Things that are dug in so when you step with your halakha you step into that hole it will change your walk. You will stumble and fall and you will miss the direction of aiming at the promised land if you step into these holes. Now these holes, when you step into enough of them, you'll either have weak ankles and just lie down and not move and not walk anymore, or you will be crippled and just stumble along, walking like a drunkard, following a different direction. And these are the prison cells and the uh, holes made by the Nachash in the wilderness. And we know that Yahweh's word is a light unto our feet and to our path. So his Torah will help us to see the holes and to step around them. Now these holes are normally either fleshly related or they relate to religion. 
Religion is a big stumbling block and a big hole that you can step into. And then you get bound up by religion. And you sit there and wait for the rapture, for example. And you're not walking anymore. You just sit there passively waiting and singing songs or whatever you do if you're imprisoned by that system. So we need to watch out for those things. It's only the Torah that can provide light so we can see those holes. All right, the next one is the phrase, lift up the head. Now we read in Numbers uh, 1 verse 2 to 4, take a census. Now take a census or count the number is the Hebrew, nasa rosh. That means lift up their heads. And lifting up the head has got several meanings. And we also found that in Torah portion 21 which was the lifting up of the heads of the people who brought half a shekel for ransom for their souls, so there won't be any plague coming near them. So this is for the redemption of the people, and it's based on your contribution. So lifting up the heads or the people that are counted or can be counted on are those who contribute within this process. Because when you're a soldier, you're not there just to dress pretty and to, to look scary. You need to actively contribute towards the battle that's raging out there to help to work, do the work of the commander or work of Messiah. So that's what this whole concept of lift up the heads, taking the census, and then to group them in a certain format, which is now the physical representation of the army. So um, he said to number the people everyone from 20 years old and above no, number 20 has the following meanings as is bahi that means my humbling achava that means brotherhood or declaration dodo that means he's beloved haya that means to exist to come to pass and jose that means seer or prophet and prophecy and yabab that means a desert now, when you look at these meanings, it gives us an idea of um, the humble um, attitude that these people need to have to become part of this brotherhood, which is the army of Yahweh. And they will be Yahweh's beloved and will be steered by his prophets through prophecy and the books of prophecy. And then those things will come to pass and all these things will happen during the time as you travel through the desert or the wilderness. So it's all about anointing and appointing people so to have the ability to see where they are going as they walk through the wilderness. And it's key that you need to be humble and you need to be united as a, a unit in order to work and function within the army of Yahweh. Now, number is the word mispar. It comes from the root word saf, uh, safar. It means to number, to score with a mark, to inscribe, to recount. It can also mean to celebrate and to declare. Now, recounting, we looked at when we discussed counting the Omer. You also recount. It's counting, remembering, thinking back. Think back to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Think back of everything you learned at the mountain because you are now in the second month, in the second year. You've done the festivals, you learned from the festivals, you received the ten words and all the instructions associated with that. Now you need to put it in practice. That's what this numbering is also about. It's setting up the army and they are now equipped to take the first step and to declare what they've learned because those things are now inscribed, supposedly, on the heart through the help of his spirit. Now the word safar is first found in scripture in Genesis 15 verse 5 which says, and he brought him, which is Abraham, from abroad and said, look now towards heaven and tell the stars if you can be able to number them. And he said to, unto him, so shall your seed be. Now stars, we already looked at as the word kokaf, uh, that means a star, and it can also mean prince or leader. Now these are the generations of Abraham who will become part of the army of Yahweh, who will be appointed, who heads will be lifted up, who will become part of the brotherhood, will be Yahweh's beloved, who will fight the battle against the enemy in the desert, in the wilderness, 
as they travel towards the promised land. So those are the anointed ones who lead the rest of the people and to help to structure them in the order of Yahweh's Torah. Um, the word number has got the gematria of 240. And there's a few words that is uh, that uh, associated with that. Is Yisrachia, that means Yahweh will shine. Kedur, that means to attack. Makak, that means fade away. Mor, that means a drop flowing down. Mer, which is a beautiful fragrance. Amalek, which is the enemy of Israel representing the flesh. So from all these meanings, numbering the people, appointing the people, give you sort of a military theme of what this appointment is all about. So the initial enemy that they need to take care of is Amalek, the flesh, that you need to uh, remove from your life because you will have daily attacks from that enemy. And when you apply Yahweh's Torah, which is the drop or the water flowing down, you need to humble yourself on your knees to drink from the water that's flowing downwards. So you will then have the strength. So the enemy will fade away. The flesh in this will fade away. And you will be able to shine Yahweh's word through your life. Express it through your life, through your actions. Living and walking in his Torah. Uh, stepping into the halakha of Yahweh. Avoiding the holes um, in the wilderness. So you won't fall. So looking at all of this, we see that there are um, a process, a progressive process that took place. When we look back, first of all, they came to faith in Egypt. That's about salvation. And then they progressively become part of Israel at the mountain. They basically were united. They signed the agreement by saying, yes, we will do everything that Yahweh says. And then... If you look at the spiritual level, the next step for a new believer coming in, becoming part of Israel, is to become part of the priesthood, to become the prince or the stars or the anointed ones who will be equipped by Yahweh's fruit of his spirit and gifts of his spirit in order to function within the collective body or the collective household to give structure and order during the time of the wilderness and as the priesthood now uh, move into the wilderness scene, we see the, four, the third transformation um, that will move the priesthood into the uh, authority of the soldiers, which is a structure. So this is a spiritual theme, a spiritual layer that applies to every single one of us. So we are lost in the world. And we came to faith in Egypt. Then we walk in his, his word and we start to grow up spiritually so we become part of his priesthood under the order of Melchizedek and once we are part of his priesthood we are ready to step into the wilderness but now we need to be transformed into soldiers and once we finish the battle and we come to the end of the wilderness we will be uh, transforming into the fourth stage which is his bride and then we will enter into the kingdom or into the house or into the promised land so those are the, the four transformations the other part of uh, his training is to get the uh, inscribed word in the hearts of the people so they can be equipped with the sword of the spirit or the sword of the word. And we see the same language in Revelation 19 verse 15, the described Mashiach, where it says, And from his mouth proceeds a sharp, a sharp sword in which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of Elohim, the Almighty, which is the word Tevaot. But Tevaot is the plural of armies. So Yahweh Tevaot is, the, is, is Yahweh of the armies. And Tava means host, army, company, assemble, warfare, soldiers, servant to serve and battle. So all of these things are in the context of a military theme, appointing people under the command of the commander Yahweh Tevaot, which is Mashiach, and from his mouth proceeds his Torah, his living Torah, the words that he will speak from the house, the bed, with the anointing, which is the upside down little um, yod, which is the anointed tongue. So we also have that anointed tongue. We read in the New Testament, do not worry what you will say, because my, the Spirit will tell you what to say and will speak 
So that is that uh, picture of the anointed tongue, uh, as we see with the letter Pei that's made up of the household, as well as the anointed tongue, which is the letter Pei. All right, so that is uh, all about the anointed ones, the stars, the princes, and the appointment. Now this is a, a visual uh, of that process. So we get saved in Egypt, which is in the theme of Passover. Then we become Israel, which is in the theme of Shavuot, the Ten Words. Then after the Ten Commandments, receiving the tablets, we are in the theme of setting up the priesthood. That's where we now start with this book, which is Babitbar, entering the wilderness. And the priesthood are now transformed as the army to be ready for the commander coming on his white horse, where we will be transformed as the bride after the battle to give the great birth, which is uh, the Day of Atonement or the Day of Judgment. And then we will be ready to enter the house. So this is just a, another layer on top of everything we already looked at. And we are currently in the scriptures. We are in Bamit Park, the wilderness, uh, moving from receiving the tablets into the four festivals. And between us and the four festivals, the final fe feast um, is Bamit Park, this wilderness period that we're going through. So everything we'll learn in this uh, uh, book in the Torah will be about the things we need to face, including enemies that we will face during the Great Tribulation. Now the other theme within this book is the redemption of the firstborn, which is about salvation, protection and unification. Now this relates to the counting of the people. Now first of all, Yahweh said the firstborn are mine, and they are from the children of uh, Israel, but then he said, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that opens the womb among the children of Israel. So he basically said that I will take the priesthood instead of your firstborn, because the task of the firstborn was basically to act as priests within the uh, family, that is to do with carrying the birthright within the household, but he's now giving that to a tribe. And when he counted the, the, the Levites, they, they added up to 22,000. There's the number 2, 2 that I mentioned previously. And when he counted the people, the firstborn of all the males, older than uh, one month, they added up to 22,273. So for the 273 remaining people who weren't accounted for by the firstborn of the Levites, they had to pay five shekels of silver as an offering and give it to Aaron and his sons for their redemption, so they can be covered as well under the, the authority of the priesthood. So they, they are now um, the first fruits of Yahweh, and they are appointed as priests. So the first fruits equals the priesthood, and they all represent people from the household, the oldest from the household. That's what Jacob and Esau's story is all about. But now it's transformed and transferred into a priesthood. So when you come to faith within your family, for example, and there's no other family's members that came to faith, you are basically the first fruit with that family regarding the anointing as the priesthood of that family. So it's your task to intercede, to facilitate, to help and support family members to get back into the household of Yahweh. So that's why random people will come to faith in different family members and family units and it's their task to intercede for those people and to act as the function as the priest because you are now appointed as the priesthood under the order of Melchizedek just as the picture we see there here under the priesthood under Levitical authority all right number 22 the gematria of that number means stumbling, falling. So that's the initial state, the fallen state. Then woe to shoot, pointed thorn, thorn which sharp cutting inner parts. So that gives us the idea of the setting up of a, a, approaching a mountain. If you cross this without the long trumpet, you will be shot or stoned. Um, there's a woe, there's a, a warning, there's a terrifying event happening when the ten words were spoken. There was also the thorn bush Mount Thorn, Mount Sinai, and the words that were sp spoken 
was cutting into the innermost parts. These commandments are sharp and they cut into the innermost parts in order to restore them to do the, the medical surgery to remove the cancer's forms of bondage and to, to cut that, that, that out. So that's what the word of Yahweh, the sword of Yahweh, is doing within the people who started this process. And then it goes through the next phases, which is the riverbank, wheat, that's a harvest, which has to do with Shavuot, the rock where the water will flow from, which is a picture of Mashiach, crevice, hiding place, that's also the rock that Moses was hidden when Yahweh revealed his 13 attributes or his character of grace. Number 13 is also to do with love, grace. Then breast, chest, to join, united, which is also the word chat. Yahweh is he, to be united with him. So that's the ultimate process. The riverbank, of course, is the Red Sea, but it's also the Nile. Ach, not the Nile. Jordan. You have to cross the river in order to step into the breast of Yahweh, the chest, the protection, the hiding place, and where you can be united back to him. So that's the whole journey of from a fallen state, Egypt, mountain, wilderness, promised land. Everything is found within the number 22. And we are in 2022, which is interesting, because we're basically in the process, I think, spiritually, prophetically, to be appointed as the official priesthood under the order of Melchizedek this year, so that we can be ready to have the halakha to lead people during this dark time of the wilderness and the famine. And I'm using the word famine uh, deliberately because we are currently worldwide entering into a famine as we speak. Um, there's a lot of food shortages already happening. And um, from our friend in Germany, the guy who wrote the book, who dictates everything, I'm not going to say his name. Um, okay, he's Klaus, but not um, Santa Klaus. <laughs> and uh, he basically mentioned in a statement that he made, there will be wars, rumors of wars, pestilence and famine. So he's basically speaking the same words that you read in Matthew 24, but he's not a believer. And he speaks from the spirit of the anti-Messiah, the anti-Messiah. And those things are drawing near. I think we are extremely close to the borderline where we're going to step into the Great Tribulation. We are in the birth pains. We will, if you read Matthew 24, wars, rumors of wars, famine, we are there. And there's going to be a big battle for your souls coming up. A lot of challenges. And we need to have our whole Allah ready and identify the holes of the enemy so we don't step into those things as we are led by fear and not by the truth and the light of Yahweh. So you need to focus. You need to know what Yahweh's word says. and Not listen to your heart. Don't be dictated by fear, led by fear. Because fear is the... the, the the force that's been created in this world over two years, and it's pushing everyone over the edge. And they're all going to fall off the cliff and not step into Yahweh's kingdom and partake in all the things that Yahweh's promised us um, to enter into his rest. Very, 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 very important. Number five, of course, means grace. So those five shekels represents Yahweh's grace. So even though if there's not enough Levites, Yahweh has grace. And if people want to join in, if there's someone who's got light to anoint it as the stars in heaven or the priesthood, um, Yahweh will use them. So be light and shine because a lot of people are looking for light because of all this darkness that's currently in this world. Now what's interesting, this redemption of the firstborn is not the first redemption. This is the second uh, uh, redemption. I don't have a typo yet. It's not resumption, it's redemption. So the second redemption of the firstborn happened in the wilderness after they heard the ten words. And this is this uh, topic today in this Torah portion. And the ten words are associated with Thornbush and Mount Thorn. In the wilderness where the mouth speaks. Now the first redemption happened where the firstborn... Um, was in Egypt just after they experienced the ten plagues, which is the woe. And when they left Egypt, they left their stumbling and falling state. 
initial state. And the second redemption is basically a picture of your second birth, to be born again. Now, when you're in sin, when you're injured, you get born again because you're physically born, so it's a spiritual born again. But I'm talking about a second spiritual born again. You get born again when you enter the tabernacle, you're just part of the mob, part of the people, you know, following Yahweh's things the best you can, and you listen to the priesthood. The second birth is to be born into the priesthood and to move from the sand of the sea into the stars in heaven to fulfill the promise that was given to Abraham. So we need that second spiritual birth in order to become the appointed leaders, the ones whose heads would be lifted up to be the army of Yahweh, to listen to the voice of the commander and to lead the people because we are leaders within the army of Yahweh, if you are born a second time in the spiritual, as the priest under the order of Malchusedek, following the commander, the king of Malchusedek. So that's a, a beautiful picture there that we see uh, with the number 22 and how it rely, uh, uh, relates to our year that we're in and prophetically and physically what we see in the world purpose of the wilderness experience this is something i'm going to jump ahead to chapter eight so that's in the next torah portion um, but it's very very important for us to understand this um, there's three things that happen in the wilderness and why we need to go through the wilderness first and foremost you need to feed you manna then he said he will humble you and then he said he will test you so we're going to look at all three of them to see what it actually means the first one we're going to look at is to humble you. That's the word ana, which is ayan nun hay. Ana means looking down, to press, to abase, self, to afflict, self-affliction, just, just in oneself, and it's also to be chastised by or disciplined by Yahweh, deal hardly with. And that's actually what um, Yom Kippur is about. It's the fast. It's where you think back, where you do introspection where you self-afflict you on a, on a deep spiritual level so that you can repent and, and, and move on. Then we also see uh, gentleness, humble self, hurt, ravish, submit self, and weaken. So it's a, it's a very weak state and a vulnerable state that you move into. And that is what true repentance is about. And that's what the second birth is about. You can only be born again when you truly repent. So you need to repent as you walk as a believer in Mashiach, in Messiah, in Jesus. You need to do another repentance, looking back of what you've done, which was selfish, because salvation is for me. You need to change your mind. Salvation is actually for the nations. And you are now elevated. Your head has been lifted. You understand better, better insights. That it's about the people who need to come in. Yes, you are also going to go in, but you are now a leader within the army of Yahweh, as he is anointed priesthood under the order of Melchizedek. So when we look at bending down to humble oneself, as we know that water flows down, that's also one of the meanings of the word, the root word of Torah, which is Yarat, to flow like water. Water always flows down, it flows from mountains down to the sea, and we need to kneel down in order to drink, Otherwise, you'll stand in the water. It doesn't mean anything. It's actually disrespectful. You stand in Yahweh's word or upon his word and, and pollute it. You need to humble yourself in order to scoop it up and to drink it. So that's the, the symbolism of that. Then we also see the, the letter iron. The letter iron means eye. And the iron is on the right, so it's spiritual eyes will be open. You'll receive insight. After you receive insight, there's a nun. Nun means fruitful. You will now become fruitful in your actions that you do. And what's your actions? It's hey, they will shine. Because those actions are in line with Yahweh's Torah and His light. And you will shine that in this dark wilderness. So that's what humility is all about. Humility is about ultimately shining the light, ultimately being fruitful, and ultimately having your eyes open so you can have revelation and see things as Yahweh see them. It's not only about bashing yourself, lying on the floor and feel sorry for yourself. It's about standing up from that space and then take on what Yahweh is giving you 
by drinking the water of the word so that those three things can happen in your life and manifest in your life. So humility is a very, very, very powerful tool for equipping the soldiers of Yahweh. The next one is to test. That's the word Nasa. Now, as you can see, it shares exactly the same letters except for the iron and the Samech. The Samech is letter 15. It's a, the pictograph is a circle. It also represents a cycle. And the iron is interesting. When I did the Aleph Bet, the iron represents a spherical force. It's actually the fountain of light. The fountain of light is like a lens that sits between the physical and the spiritual. And the or with the Aleph is the original light, which is Yahweh's light, that shines through this lens, which is a limited light that manifests in your life, which is your revelation, your insight that you receive. But that iron is also the big by a turning force with an upward thrust. So as you receive revelation, you also receive elevation to lift you up. Now, Sa, that has to do also with lifting up the head and um, the appointment and the anointing. So that's the interesting thing about the, looking at the Samech and the iron in relation to one another. Now, when I saw with the Samech, uh, means to test, to attempt something new. So that is the new cycle they just started, stepping into the wilderness, second year, second month, first day. And to prove them. You've now learned all these things. Now you need to be tested and prove. It's like writing an exam. Uh, exam. It's not like, oh, you're going to go through all these bad things. Yes, you will probably. But it's more so a positive approach to it. And this is also what Yeshua went through when he stepped into the wilderness. He was tested. And this is the theme of this Torah portion. He's stepping into the wilderness. After Yeshua was baptized, after his second born again experience, being appointed and anointed, with the tough coming down. And that's also the theme of our first Shavuot. We're going to do, we're going to do two Shavuots. The first one is celebrating the ten words, which has to do with the words being spoken, which is the uh, uh, word of Yahweh through his spirit, which is a symbol of the dove coming down of Yeshua, the flames of fire on the people's heads, which is the burning Mount Sinai where the people listen to the voice. Um, that's also the tongues of fire that came down on the people. It's all about them speaking the word of Yahweh in different languages so everyone can hear. So that's the first thing we're going to celebrate. And that has to do with uh, this lifting up the heads and the sa that we discussed. And the tenting and the trial that Yeshua received after he received his second birth and his fire coming down on his head, the tongues of fire, anointing him to start his ministry. And our ministry is now soldiers in the army of Yahweh. That's our ministry. And when you look at the word Nasa, it's a homophone. So that means there's a word that sounds exactly the same when you speak it, but it's written differently. Um, it's written with an Aleph at the end, not a Hey. Aleph we know represents Yahweh, uh, 26, and it's expressing the Aleph on the left. So this is when you're in a trial and ex uh, 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 temptation, what do you do? When you look at the uh, le uh, lemon, when you squeeze a lemon, there's supposed to be lemon juice or orange juice when you squeeze an orange. But when you squeeze a Christian, the devil comes out. We're supposed to squeeze the believers in Mashiach and Aleph comes out, Yahweh comes out, his character comes out. So when Yeshua was uh, tested and tried in the wilderness, he spoke the word of Yahweh. He didn't fall over and complain and whatever. Because that's not the Aleph, that is your weakness. So we need to make sure we have the right character when trials and tribulations come. And this is basically to prepare us for crossing the border, stepping into the great tribulation. That's where this testing will actually happen. So we need to humble ourselves now in preparation. So we can become fruitful and walk in our Lachal of Yahweh, shining His light. Because when the pressure is turned on, you need to be in the habit of doing that so you can still express Him and His light when the times get tough. Now, Nasa means to burn, to cast, to bear, 
bear up, bring forth, contain, desire, stir up, swear as in an oath. It also means to lift, to accept, to arise, to be able to. It also means armor, to exalt self, to extol, to forgive, to furnish, to give, to go on, to help, hide, hold up, honorable man, to marry, magnify, pardon, rise up, receive, respect, carry away, take away, take up, and yield. So all these things, I probably need to move Mary to the end. All these things has to do with the character being tested on the, the pressure cooker. And there's a lot of things that will happen as you get tested. You will grow in these things. And all the things I made blue here, that's what you will become. You will be an honorable man and honorable woman. Um, you will uphold these things. Uh, you will be able to forgive people who persecute you. Um, you will be exalted. You will exalt Yahweh. And eventually, you will be carried away to the marriage feast and you will be come one with him and uh, be part of the yield or the, the multitude that stand before the throne of Yahweh. So that's a beautiful picture of the outcome of the testing. Now, when we look at the two Nasars, the one with the A and the one with the Aleph, the first Nasar has to do with the testing in the wilderness. The second Nasar has to do with the final goal. It's perseverance. While you're on the test, you need to persevere. And then you will be uh, able to become one echad with Yahweh in, and sit at the marriage feast. So that's the testing. The third thing is to feed you manna. Now we looked at manna before, it's also relating to the counting of the Omer. Now feed is the word akal, which is aleph, kaf, lamet. It means to eat, dine, food. But also means to burn up, to consume, to devour, and freely. And when you look at the burn up, consume, and devour, it's like a fire burning in relation to freely. The, the one seemed negative, the other one seemed more positive. And it has to do with choice when you eat. Now, when you eat things, you can eat food, but you can also eat opinions, you can eat truth, you can eat lies, you can eat doctrine. It's anything you consume through your ears or through your mouth or through your eyes. And that can have either two outcomes. The one leads to freedom. The other one leads to consumption and to be burned up. And that's the same thing we saw last week. When we look at Mahukatai, um, we had to let the kuf in the middle. That means to turn the head, to repent. And to make a decision. So you can either decide to go through the letter Chet. To access the letter Bet. Which is the house of Yahweh. Or you can go through the letter Taf. Which is also a doy. Which means death. But then we have the hand of Yahweh. Which is chastisement. Where there will be a heating up experience. So that you can come back. Repent. And then enter through the right door. So that's what the eating of the manna. Is a cycle of decision. Whenever you. Make a decision, am I going to pick up manna tomorrow? Oh, what day is it? Oh, it's day one, day five, whatever. If it's day seven, no, you should have picked up twice yesterday. So it's all about making a decision while you eat. And it's also relating to the Garden of Eden, where there was a choice. Which tree to eat from and which tree not to eat from. Yahweh gave them a choice and they made the wrong choice. And that ended up into the burning fire. And that's the fallen state that we we being scorched in this world because of the uh, imbalance within the creation as well as in the spirit. And we now need to repent through the letter Kuf, find the right gate, the Chet, enter through life into the house of Yahweh. And that's what this is all about. If we keep on making the wrong decisions, even ignoring Yahweh's chastisement, we will end up in spiritual death, which is the final separation. And then you have to wait for Yahweh to take care of you and sort you out. Uh, whatever ways that will look like in the future. All right, so I'm going to quickly jump back onto the theme of counting the Omer. So we are in Omer 48, we're the 4th of June. Our Jewish brothers celebrate uh, Shavuot today. It actually started, I think, Friday evening through Saturday, through Sunday, up to Sunday evening. And then 
Uh, I don't know what they do Monday. I know they, they celebrate and dance and read Torah throughout the night and day. So that's happening uh, today in their time 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 zone. Um, but when we counted the Omer, it was slightly different. So according to the Omer count, we are still two weeks away from the Shavuot based on uh, the ten words, because that's what we want to celebrate. We want to celebrate um, the spirit coming down on the mountain, the fire coming down, as well as the tongues of fire, which will come down on the heads of people. So that's about hearing the word of Yahweh through the revelation of his spirit after your second birth, which is your appointment as the priesthood. So that's our time frame, and we plan to celebrate it at sunset on Saturday the 18th, and then the day of Sunday is the actual day of Shavuot number one, which is the first theme, which is the theme of the 10 words. And then later on, the 12th of August, we will do Shavuot number two, which is the theme of receiving the tablets, which is also to be acknowledged, I think. All right, so, um, this is just a little summary of where we're at. We are currently between the mountain and the Jordan. And what we experience is the tabernacle, the priesthood, enemies um, being led by Yahweh's column of fire, column of cloud. And we travel following the man with the tablets. We're following the Ark of the Covenant with the tablets in there. So that is our authority that points to the direction where we should go. And the spirit of Yahweh led them through the two columns um, to give them direction that led to the promised land. So just to recap quickly on what it means on a spiritual level. So when we travel through the wilderness, there's some parts of you that's still entrapped in Egypt. You still have some sin and bondage. You're still looking back, longing back for whatever. And you need to deal with that because that's one of the, the holes in the wilderness that you will step into. It's another entrapment, another bondage. It will make your ankles weak as you step into the holes and stop you from walking ultimately if you keep on stepping in these holes. So you need to rid yourself from that because we're very close to the border. There's not much time left to sort out your, your, your life in order to be effective uh, within the army of Yahweh. The other part of us, um, some of us already experienced a second spiritual birth. So some of that parts of your life or your areas in your life are already in the promised land. Do you experience some of the aspects that you enjoy um, that you will see in an experience in the promised land as well? So that's a mature level of reaching towards that level of holiness as you sort out your life, study the word, uh, following Yahweh's uh, commandments, walking in his halakha, and um, helping other people become more, um, less selfish, and more thinking like Mashiach. It's more about the salvation of others than your salvation. But the reality is that the majority of us are still entrapped within the wilderness. So we sit amongst the three stages, but the majority of us is trapped in this wilderness, which is called this life. Because life has challenges, there's a lot of things happening, and we need to be focused, keep our eyes on, on, on Yahweh, keep our eyes on the Word, and then help and support one another as we walk in this collective household of Yahweh, um, supporting and, and uh, helping one another uh, through the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. So that's just a, a bit, bit of a side note on where we sit spiritually and where we are prophetically and what other things we are about to face. So that concludes our study for today. Um, is there any questions or comments? All right, so if there's no comments or questions, I'll close it here.
Oh, there's someone. <laughs> Hello. I can't hear anything. The person with the iPhone. Oh. All right. Anyway, I will uh, now close in prayer and then we'll um, conclude this study. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to go through your word, to discuss your word, to look at the things. And um, what really struck me is where we are prophetically and how close we are to your coming. Father, I ask that you help us to make an effort to take you serious and to sort out our lives, to spend time in your world, to work with one another and to grow in holiness, in truth, so we can express your character and your Torah through our actions as we prepare for your coming. Father, I ask that you be with us uh, for the next week. You will help us, equip us, help us to uh, practically do everything we learned through the help of your Spirit. I ask in all the mighty name of Yeshua Messiah. Amen. All right, thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely day. I will um, speak to you soon in our next meeting. Shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no worries. Have a lovely day. Shalom.